We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. What is stopping you from living to your full potential? My witness today believes that buried trauma can keep you unconsciously trapped in the past and shape your life in ways you don't recognize. Dr. Galit Atlas is a psychoanalyst in private practice in Manhattan, USA, and a faculty member of the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. She's the author of Emotional Inheritance, Moving Beyond the Legacy of Trauma. Now, your parents did everything to hide their trauma and painted their childhoods, to quote you, in beautiful colours. What were they burying and how successful were they at doing it? So first of all, I'm really happy to be here with you today and to talk about uh, the unsaid, the unspeakable, the ways our traumas hold us back and even our parents' and grandparents' traumas can have an impact on our lives. My parents emigrated. My father uh, moved from Iran when he was uh, a young boy. My mother uh, emigrated from Syria. And both of them grew up in poverty. Both of them, I found out later, lost uh, siblings when they were young. And interestingly, they never told us about that shared history of theirs. I did know that my mother lost her brother, when he was 14, he drowned in the sea and she was 10 years old. And I talk about it in Emotional Inheritance. But I think that I grew up in a in a home that tried to be happy, that believed, like many traumatized people, that digging in the past is not useful, that it's better to be happy, optimistic and think about the future. And you were growing up in Israel. I mean, was that the sort of general culture of Israel to sort of look to the future rather than think about the past? You know, I think it's an it's probably true. I'm, I'm in the US now for many, many years. And I think to some degree, I think it's even more common here. Israel is a place that was founded on uh, the shadow of the Holocaust. So there is a lot of Holocaust uh, talk in Israel, uh, thinking about the past and thinking about we will never forgive, we will never forget, which also creates uh, huge problems, as many know. Uh, so I think that this, there is a delicate balance here between um, forgetting and remembering, right? Cherishing the past versus cherishing the future. In my family, were what a surprise we've both become uh, therapists. My family believed in silence as well. Mm -hmm. And the facts were known, but they were dismissed as unimportant. So, for example, my mother's father died a couple of months before my mother and her twin brother were born. So can you imagine wow. the trauma of being pregnant, not just with one child, but two children, and your wow. husband had died? And my grandfather was never mentioned. And right to almost the day that my mother died, she always said, well, it didn't matter. My grandfather and my grandmother came to live with us and I never felt the lack. Mm -hmm. So do you think they were right that there was no lack or do you think that that might be one of the reasons? <laughs> <laughs> You're a therapist. <laughs> you know, I think that definitely uh, we are dealing with uncovering secrets and uh, uncover and right making the unspeakable speakable as therapists. And so definitely I would say that. But I think that so many people who are not therapists do. I mean, so many people grew up with silences and your story sounds unusual, but I think what I found after I published my book, uh, from many, many people who contact me from all over the world, you know, the book was translated to 23 languages, so I can compare the cultures also <laughs> and see, you know what? It is universal. A lot of people grew up with silences around 
death of a parent, death of siblings is probably one of the most common silence. Uh, in the book, there are at least two, I think three chapters that talk about siblings who passed away. And in some cases, the siblings that is alive d- did not even know about it and found out only later on. And so I think there, the silence is everywhere. Now, another protection is the one, it's normal. Everybody goes through it. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Now, the Yom Kippur in Israel happened when you were two years old and your sister was actually born on the first day of it. Right, what, exactly. What do you think has been the impact of the conflict in Israel on your psyche? You know, I started investigating that when I moved to the U.S. 20 years ago, because I think in, to some degree trauma is normalized in Israel, our own trauma and the trauma in the Middle East, right? The traumas of, of the Palestinians. So all of that is so normalized. And I think that for us, people who serve in the army and people who, and you know, in the occupation, of course, all of that is something that has enormous impact on the mind of both sides. And uh, definitely as I moved to the U.S. and started seeing people who are second and third generation of Holocaust survivors or people who served in the army, in the U.S. army and the Israeli army, I started unpacking my own trauma around what does it mean to be born and raised in a country that is in constant war. And, you know, I think when I, when I read the audiobook of my book, that was the part where I started sobbing because suddenly I was so overwhelmed with the feeling of our own longing for peace, our own longing for normal life, our own long as people, you know, but politicians have their own, you know, agenda, but the people, the people want to have peace. The people want to, to live with each other. They don't want to lose their children. They don't want to lose their parents. They don't want to have, you know, be exposed to all of that trauma. And I think as kids and teenagers, that was the thing that we were connected to, in touch with. We want normal life, but we don't really know what that means. And you were always concerned that the terrorists would choose your house. Tell me about that. Yes, you know, as as a young child, I was very preoccupied with terrorism and feeling like, oh, maybe we, we are never safe. I think many, many people people in in my generation grew up with those feelings that we are, maybe we're unsafe, maybe something might happen to us, and how do we protect ourselves? And I think some of it is actually related to the Holocaust. It is related to feeling that we grew up with that legacy, that that as Jews, we're not safe. I mean, look what's happening right now in the world. It brings up a lot of a lot of anxiety, a lot of fears about being unsafe and, and persecution. Anti-Semitism, of course, is related to all of that. And I think as a child, the feeling is like, okay, how, trying to think, how did they survive? The people who survived, how did they survive? And as children, we think... Okay, maybe maybe we should find a place to hide. That if somebody comes in, and I used to do that, and I talk about it in the book about hiding with my baby brother, because I heard so many stories about the babies crying and they expose your, you know, where you hide. And and I tried to think, so what do I do if my baby brother cries? And I think all of that are things that as a child, do you think, yeah, that's what people do, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about now being in a pandemic and how, in a way, my children grew up here and, and some normalization of like, that's what we do, right? We're, we wear masks. We wear, you grow up in a reality and you don't actually question it until you move to a different place. So join the dots for me of, about how that might actually turn up 20, 30 years later in your life. When I moved to the US, there was one interesting thing for me, you know, I used to be so alert around especially terror and and many, many of my friends and people in my generation grew up like that. I grew up when I was in my 20s, there were a lot of terror attacks and explosions of buses in Tel Aviv where I grew up. So every time we heard like a balloon popped, we would jump as if something really terrible happens. It took me years to to not have the intensity of that feeling. I still have it. I I always will. But 
to start and heal and understand and reflect on what happened. And, and as a psychoanalyst, of course, writing about trauma, writing about the legacy of trauma, that's where, you know, I write in the book that uh, research is me search. And so going back into my own me search of my family trauma, the legacy of my family, but also where I grew up and other people, right? I, I mean, the, the book is really talking about all of us and all kind of cultures and religions and, and racism, uh, right? And those traumas that we live and relive for generations to come. When I was 19, I worked on, I don't know if you've ever heard of a radio station called The Voice of Peace. That was yes, on a, I did. It was on a boat. On a boat off the coast of Israel, which mm-hmm. I used to be on. So, uh, mm-hmm. Kan Kola Shalom, which is yes. The Voice of Peace in, in Hebrew. So, when I had shore leave, I would sort of go to Jerusalem, or I'd come from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv. And there's a bus, at least in those days, we're talking a very long time ago, that literally as soon as one bus is gone, the next one pulls up because there are just so many people want to go. And when the bus arrives, because it's a notorious, or it was then a notorious place, the bus station for bombs to go off, literally everybody fights to get on the bus. Old ladies fall, <laughs> nobody picks them up, they step over them. I mean, the the, the fear is so yeah. great. And I don't think when you're actually there living in it, you quite realise how deeply that goes into you. Yes, the fear is great and we tend to normalise fear and we tend to deny it. And I I mentioned in the book that when I was um, 18 years old, it was the Gulf War and missiles were, were shot, you know, from Iraq to Tel Aviv where I lived. And as teenagers, I mean, 18 year old kids, 19, we used to go on the roofs to see where the missiles land. And we thought that was so exciting and so fun. We did not, we did not recognize our fear. Of course, we were afraid. Of course, who wouldn't, right? We, you, you saw the missile comes, you saw the missile, where did they land? You, you heard, you hear the explosion. And I think what you do with it is that it creates this bodily experience, right? That we know that is related to fear, and you translate it into something else. You translate it into the meaning you give it is not necessarily of fear. It could translate into excitement, sometimes sexual excitement, by the way, into things that are supposed to protect you from knowing that you're in danger because there's nothing you can do. So um, I write about a little bit in the book about like I was I was a singer back then and uh, we were traveling and and performing everywhere and every time there was a, a siren we would say let's go on the roof let's see where the missiles uh, hit and in fact actually you were using your sexual attraction to the drummer to actually <laughs> push this sort of down so you know your musical director is flat on the bottom of, <laughs> flat on the bottom of the bus saying you know my my wife is pregnant you know i i didn't realize we were going to the blooming golan heights and you know you're quashing your fear by flirting with the drummer right because love and sexuality and life i would say they're very powerful And so you manage your fear with other things. I think sexuality is one of them. And and in the book, I really talk a lot about that tension. If you remember in the chapter on sexual, uh, on affairs. It's funnily enough, I'm going to talk about that in a second. But (laughs) before we go there, let's look at the up-to-date research on this, because it's not just psychoanalysts and psychotherapists sitting in their office seeing these. It's called epigenetics, is that correct? Uh Uh-huh, And they've done research that actually shows this in a scientific way. Can you tell me about that? So you see, epigenetics is really the research and the biological mechanism by which trauma is transmitted from generation to generation. And we know that trauma is uh, passed down from generation to generation through multiple pathways. And in the book, I, I talk about a few of them. The unconscious is one of them, right? And we know as psychoanalysts, we think about unconscious communication and what parents transmit to their kids non-verbally. 
the most powerful messages of all are the non-verbal ones, aren't they? The yes. things that you don't say. My family never said, you know, we don't talk about things. Words make things, oh, and emotions make things worse. Those words were never <laughs> said they didn't need to. It was sort of running in the water, so to speak. Exactly. Running in the water. Exactly. And the feeling is that as young children, if we think about the attachment bond, right, where children really monitor everything about their parents, what we know is that we listen to the gaps as well. We hear very loudly what is not said. And I think that is a big, big part of the nature you know, the nurture piece of, of intergenerational transmission of trauma, where the trauma is transmitted in the nonverbal through what is not said in the gaps and in the body language, of course. And then we go into the biology and the neuroscience, to, just to give you a, a, a bigger picture of, you know, intergenerational transmission of trauma, which is uh, the research that started right after a little bit after, not exactly right when there was a second generation after the Holocaust. And so psychoanalysis had, you know, had these psychoanalysts who were mostly Holocaust survivors and their patients who were Holocaust survivors as well. And immigrants, uh, second generation, started investigating that in the 50s. And the first psychoanalytic conference of uh, the international IPA was in the 60s. In the 90s, we see the epigenetic research. Rachel Yehuda from uh, Mount Sinai was one of the pioneers of that uh, research, which basically shows that the environment, and when we talk about the environment, we mean the psychological environment, has an impact, a physical impact on the expression of genes. And that is passed down to the next generations. And so we see that the genes are, do not change, but the expression of genes is impacted by trauma chemically. And so in, in that sense, I think Rachel Yehuda says the genes have memory, right? Mm. So let's talk about Eve and her affair, because you talk about a, a wonderful term, then I think I'd quite like to unpick this, and then we'll look at how it affected Eve. And this is the idea of the dead mother. And the mothers are not actually physically dead, but they're dead in a different way. So explain to me how they are dead. So with the dead mother is a term that was coined by the psychoanalyst Andre Green. Of course, he used the mother and not the father, which is important to say, because these days it could apply to both, because the mo mothers used to be the main caregivers. And what does it mean when your main caregiver is emotionally absent, emotionally dead? He was talking about that deadness that happened usually because of trauma, depression, but, but some trauma that is not fully processed, and an inability of the parent to be fully present there for their child. So the child is really raised by a dead parent that is emotionally absent. And you could see that in the Eve case about her mother, who's, who spends a lot of time in bed and who lost her own mother when she was young. So when we talk about the deadness in these families and the trans, the transmission of, of the deadness. And one thing that Andre Green said that I think is, is interesting and important is to understand what happened to the child when the, their main caregiver, let's say the mother, is dead. And he says that in order to survive, our wish will always be to connect with the parent. And so if the parent cannot come to us, we will go to them. So if the parent cannot be brought back to life, the child will deaden part of herself in order to connect with the mother and be with her. Right. And so where do affairs fit into this? In Eve's case, which is a, a very, you know, um, there, is, there is a narrative there that you could really hear how, what happened to Eve, who had a very beautiful marriage. She said she has a 
what what people call girl, good husband and nine of his kids, two children that she loves. And then suddenly one day she finds herself, and I say it in quotation mark, right? She, because of course she chose that. She found herself in an affair and that's how she comes to my office. What we really struggle with when it comes to affair is always that delicate balance between, or tension, I would say, between the wish to destroy uh, the destructive part of affairs, to ruin the, the love, the goodness, and life itself, right? I mean, th- there is always that feeling that uh, for every, I have, you know, I've seen many, many people in treatment that come to see me because they are they feel trapped in, in an affair. And the feeling is that there is always the fear that it will destroy their lives. Right, and we see like that's the destructive piece that it destroys the love they have, they, and that it will destroy the people they love, right? Hurt them so much and destroy everything. And on the other hand, there is the eros, which represents not only sex but also the urge to survive, to create, to produce, and to love. You see, so we see love in both sides of the destruction and the the creation, right? And there is the question, I think, in Eve's case, why is she having this affair? And what is the balance between the wish to destroy and the wish to survive? Because she is sort of presenting to you a bit like a child in the in your room, isn't she? Yes, she's a child. And I think she is a child who is, uh, to some degree, motherless. So a child who is uh, feeling abandoned. I mean, I ask her in the first session, A question that I often ask people, what's your first memory? What is your first childhood memory? And Mm. that is an an important question because often in first memories, buried are the reason people come to therapy, memories that are repressed from before or, or from after that presented memory. And for Eve, she says that that first memory is about uh, her parents forgetting to pick her up from school. She was waiting there and they never showed up. And the, the, you, so you hear already, right, <laughs> that she was forgotten. And I think that is part of the deadness in her history. She's a forgotten child. And part of just to connecting back to the affair, what we find out, I don't want to ruin, give you spoilers, but what we find out later is really how her affair is connected to her dead mother, the deadness in her, her dead grandmother, and the wish to survive, to repair, that in fact becomes a repetition of her history. As we all, you know, often see that the reparation, the wish for reparation becomes in fact a repetition. So are you saying that in some sort of kind of deep unconscious way that she's having the affair to feel alive, not just for herself, but for her mother and her grandmother? Is that what you're saying? Yes. For her grandmother, for her mother, and for her children. You see, we connect past, present, and future. Because she wants to be a mother who is alive, as opposed to her own mother, for her children. She doesn't want to be a dead mother to her children. In fact, what happens is that she becomes a dead mother who is preoccupied with an affair. So she's not in bed, lying in bed, you know, sleeping, but she's in bed in other ways, (laughs) right? (laughs) So you see that... (laughs) The symbolism. (laughs) The symbolism of the bed, right? It's like, you see that in in the... uh, in this, in the chapter itself, there is a part there where she goes to her mother and asks her to have a dog. If you remember, she finds a dog on the street and she comes, mom, and, and the mom is, is in bed. And the grandmother is dying in bed, right? So there, the bed is really like a symbol for a lot of things. And she, and she finds herself, and again, I'm saying finds herself as if she didn't choose it, because I think there is a part of her that did not consciously choose it to be in, in bed with a man and become herself a dead mother to her children in her wish to repair, in her wish to become alive and not die, right? And so I think that that's, in many cases, that is the way to unpack the unconscious wish behind the affair in order to heal. 
And would you unpack this to Eve? Would she actually find what we're saying actually helpful? And would that connect with her? Or are you doing this on a sort of an unconscious level and you're talking to her just sort of in a much more practical day-to-day kind of way? That's a really good question. And I think both are true. Because, of course, when when I write the chapter, I, I make it very, very neat. And this is, as you know, a very, very slow and delicate and nuanced process that is not a magical, like, oh, this is what we find out. That the reading of the chapter is more like that <laughs> than the actual process. And in the actual process, we go back and forth between exploring what's going on, the insights and the connections I mean, to me, the psychoanalytic work, much of it, and and in a parallel way, probably reading the book, is about making connections. The biggest compliment I can get from readers is that they read this book and and make connections to their own life, even though the chapters might be and the stories might be very different from their own life, right? So, but the making of the connections with Eve in therapy is to really making connections between past present, and again, the the wish for the future, our fantasy about the future. And how are those connected to each other? So some of this stuff is hidden from ourself as well. So it's not just that our parents are hiding stuff and our grandparents. We actually... We're actually very good at hiding stuff from ourselves. <laughs> totally. So to illustrate this, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about Alice, who was pleased her child was not going to ha- carry her own genes. So what was she hiding from herself? You know, I think the question of hiding things from ourselves is really important, especially because we tend to blame our parents for hiding things from us. And what happens is that not only that we tend to hide things from ourselves because a simple reason, right? Knowing is too scary. Knowing something, even for us, is has consequences. We then know, then and then we have to, you know, to know it is to feel it. And we don't always want to do that. So we use all of our defense mechanisms and we can talk about that to to hide things from ourselves. And the other piece about hiding things is that you know, one of the ironic things about exploring the past and our parents' secrets and releasing our the next generation, right, from carrying the legacy that we carry is that we have to know and be aware that we create our own secrets from our children. So it is it is an ongoing process and each generation will have to unpack something from the previous generation. So going back to Alice, I think Alice mother had a lot of trauma. Her father left them. And I'm saying them because the experience that she had is that the father left not only her mother, he left her too, which often the experience of younger kids, he he left them and she and and left the mother uh, very devastated. So she grew up with a a devastated mother that was talking a lot about her own losses. The father was only one of them because she it that separation was evoked the previous separations and the death of her own mother of Alice's grandmother and what Alice wanted is to save her daughter from that destiny and wanted to have a child that is not genetically hers so she could save that daughter from the bad genes as she called it so the egg was donated, the womb was donated, and it was her husband's sperm. I think that's yes, correct, yes. isn't it? Yes. This this chapter really talks about reproduction and a very complicated thing. I mean, Alice is, there are many, many women like Alice that have to, uh, it wasn't her choice, by the way, originally. She couldn't get pregnant and there is a lot of, there's a lot of pain. There is a lot of demonic thinking. I mean, each woman who had to go through, and I'm saying women because I think it's especially women feel and get in touch with with those feelings of, why does it happen to me? Is it because I am not supposed to be a mother? Is it because, you know, a lot of omnipotent fantasy about what is wrong with me? Am I damaged? Am I bad? Does it mean that I'm not going to be a good mother? And all of those 
feelings Alice experienced as well as many, many of my patients who go through this really, really, really painful process of uh, IVF or uh, not being unable to get pregnant. It touches something very, very deep in us uh, for those of us who want to get pregnant and cannot. And I think for Alice, part of her rationalization maybe was, or I would even say manic defense, was to think that maybe it's better for me. Maybe it's better for my child to not have my genes. I have bad genes. So, but I want to emphasize that it wasn't just because she chose it. It was also because she couldn't get pregnant and was in a lot of pain around that. And that was her way to feel a little better about the choices she made to have a child that is not biologically hers which is again we can talk about that it's a it's a very it's a very complicated and painful process and part of what we need to unpack there are the demonic fantasies about maybe i am bad you know maybe it means something bad about me so she was hiding the negative feeling she had for herself yes yes which is very common you yes. know it's very common to have those negative feelings and to and to struggle with them and what happens when you as a kind therapist <laughs> begins to point this out? You know, I hear you. I think that this process is very gentle. I understand those feelings. I went through my own, you know, infertility years ago. So I understand how painful that is. So pointing it out is not saying, hey, you, you feel bad about yourself. That's what's going on. It's really understanding that this is too painful to to be with. I think one of the, you know, the things that I'm discussing in, in the chapter is that moment when she comes to therapy and says, you know, she has a surrogate mother and she, she says, everybody's in touch with their surrogate mother and I do not want to do that. And I feel really guilty. I feel terrible that, that I don't care actually about how she feels. <laughs> right. And, and we sit with that. Right, because because it creates a lot of guilt, but in fact, underneath that, there is a lot of pain about the surrogate mother is pregnant with my child, and not caring about how she feels is to some degree a defense, right? It's to some degree a way to say maybe it is painful to know how she feels, and it's not about me not caring about her; it's about me caring very, very, very much about you know about other things. And understanding if, you know, there is the question if she would be in the birth room with surrogate or not. And, you know, it brings a lot of questions and a lot of, a lot of pain about, and a lot of feelings. How is that going to be? Is it going to be too much for me to see another woman giving birth to my own child or not? I mean, at the end, I think part of the process was that she was able to, to work those things through enough to be in touch with that woman, to embrace her, to to appreciate her, to be grateful. You so you know, in psychoanalysis we always talk about that delicate tension between envy and gratitude. And I think in that specific situation, there are both, right? There is an envy, but it, there is also a lot of gratitude. And we work through that. And one of our problems in our society is we celebrate gratitude all the time. Everybody's doing a gratitude diary at the moment. But I wonder <laughs> how many people listening to this podcast are currently doing an envy diary. And <laughs> that might be something that would be really revealing to think about, you know, what you are envious about. What, what do you think we'd discover if we kept an envy diary? You know, I, first of all, I think we might discover that it's too much, that it's really scary to envy other people. And to some degree, I think health is about also defending against it. But I think, the, again, it's all on a, on a uh, continuum, right? Uh, how much we could uh, identify things do we envy and understand through that what we want in life, right? If we don't know that we envy that, we don't know that we want that. But envy has more destruction in it, is the wish to, you know, the, the the biggest defenses against envy, right? Or the, the biggest wishes when you are envying someone is either to take, to spoil it for them or to take it from them. Either you want to take it 
And if you can't take it, you're going to say, okay, I can't take it. So let me, let me spoil it for them. Let me tell them that what they have is not good enough. And, and that's what we see usually with people who are very envious. And I think what we want is to be able to moderate that. The, again, we go back to destruction and creation with gratitude, understanding, and with creation. Right, because the the assumption is that we cannot have it. That's why we want to get it for to steal it from the other person or to ruin it for them, right? So hold, and create holding these opposites together, both the envy and the gratitude at the same time. So yes. maybe maybe it should be a mixed diary, an envy and gratitude diary. Yes, exactly. Diary. You know, I think that life is really always about those tensions between between love and hate, right? You can't never hate your partner, right? Uh, but <laughs> could you, right? I think it's not realistic. Oh, please. <laughs> we want to be able to hate them a little bit and love them more. And you envy them a little bit and have gratitude and, and give, you know, it's also between taking and giving, right? You don't want to just take, you want to be able to also give. And that balance is, you know, really important in uh, to create. And also you don't want to be just giving because if you don't do any taking, you're just going to be completely and utterly exhausted, aren't you? Exactly. I mean, that's what we talk about when we talk about codependency. If you, uh, you know, if you know some of the theory of codependency is really about giving much, much, much more than taking. We want to be able to have the balance between the two. So, is our genetic inheritance our fate? The good news is that none of the research really believes that it's something we cannot change. Because if the environment, the psychological environment is something that creates it, the psychological environment is also something can mod modify it back. And a lot of the research really talks about therapy as one factor, communities, families, the whole process of healing. Each, each of us have our own way. You know, I do psychoanalysis and other people do other kinds of modalities, but that that healing process is something that changes who we are. And of course, the connection between the mind and the body. You know, I have in the book, I, I write that when our mind remembers, our body is allowed to forget and that is part of the process, the process of remembering. Say that again, because I think that's really beautiful. I, I'm trying to remember exactly how I said. I think that it's the, the actual quote says that when our mind remembers, our body is allowed to forget. That's beautiful. And I think one thing that I think is really important to, to stress is there is no scale about trauma. So we've talked about the Holocaust, which, you know, is obviously a great trauma, but you don't have to be up there in the Holocaust or slavery to have had trauma, do you? Right. I mean, we, you know, it's it's a big topic about what trauma is, and there is a lot of uh, arguments about it. Some people even say that we overuse the word trauma these days. I think that we basically usually differentiate between small T trauma and big T trauma and traumas that are ongoing, uh, relational traumas, abuse. And it doesn't have to be one big event like in the US here, 9-11 is a huge trauma, but an ongoing you know, abuse or or anything. I mean, uh, think about it. Into some degree, even COVID uh, was very, very traumatic for people. And we still don't know the impact of that trauma on us and on the next generation. There is no doubt that there, there will be impact. And some people argue, is it is it actually trauma? Is it only stress? Is it only like uh, distress? Is it right? But I think that these days we really understand that anything that impacts our our physical body and our chemical and our right and our mind is traumatic. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. If you'd like to participate in the programme and send us in a letter for me to discuss with my experts, you can go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com 
facebook.com forward slash podcast and you'll find a form that will allow you to send a message to me. And somebody who's done that is this correspondent who's a woman. My boyfriend and I are both 26 and have been together for a year and a half, but have been friends for about six years. The first nine months were great. Very regular sex, but about nine months in, I suffered a bad bout of mental health due to ongoing issues with body dysmorphia, and I started to push him away. This lasted about six weeks, by which point he had distanced himself, as he felt as though I didn't love him or like him anymore. By the time I was ready to be myself again, he had changed, and we were fighting more and more, because I felt insecure and was constantly trying to test whether he cared. It was also at this point that we went from having sex five times a week to once every two weeks, then to three, and now to four. We've had discussions about this, as sex is really important for me to feel connected to someone and see our relationship as more than a friendship. He initially thought there was something wrong with him, low testosterone, etc. But the more conversations we've had, the more it seems that the continuous fighting has made him emotionally unavailable for sex. I've been working on my need for reassurance with my therapist, and the fights have decreased, but there is an odd occasion when I bring up the subject. Ultimately, my mood is seriously affected by the lack of sex, and I believe that we would have less arguments if we could get back to having sex regularly. He is very much of the mindset that if he doesn't feel like having sex spontaneously, then he can't have sex. I don't know what to do. I love him a lot, but I feel I'm too young to be in a sexless relationship and it's having a serious impact on my mental health. Well, Gallet, as you write a lot about sexuality, I couldn't have found a better person to (laughs) share this letter with. So what were your thoughts? You know, it's really interesting because my first thought was, right now, is that this is not about sex at all. Oh, yeah. Wow. Tell me about that. And I would love to hear your thoughts too. But, you know, sex... We know that sex is never only sex, right? And this letter sounds to me really, and whatever the letter and what, what's happening with this couple sounds to me that it is not about sex. Sex is only like a way to express something, but it sounds to me that this is about self esteem, mm-hmm. that this is about rejection, it's about safety, it's even about power. Yeah, I was definitely thinking power and control. Right. It, it, that's what I thought. It's about power, and then I'm, and then I and then I thought right now, why do we need to use right? Why do why why do we need to control the other person and feel powerful and, and be the one that decides when we have sex and when not? And it sounds to me that both of them struggle with self esteem. Yeah, they both feel very Issues. small inside. Yeah, and need the other in order to be accepted. And loved, which we all do, right, to some degree. But we see how that plays itself out in the sexual, right? The sexual becomes the playground for all of our unresolved issues and relived in the couple that both of them feel unsafe. It sounds to me like the partner also feels rejected at first, right? And wounded and unsafe. And then they flip it. You know how they say it in the sexual world, like the top becomes bottom, the bottom becomes top. <laughs> right? Yeah, And actually, a lot of people play with power and control actually in sex games, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And, when, and if, it, if it's done with consent and with acknowledgement that that's what you're doing, it could be a pretty fun. creative thing. And yeah. fun. But, but in this situation, sound it sounds fun. like there is no awareness of that. It doesn't sound fun. It sounds like it wounds everybody, right? Yeah. So how do they, how do they begin to unpack this then? You know, I think that the only way to unpack things that are expressed through the sexual is to talk about the non-sexual, to not talk about sex, to talk about emotions, right? To talk about feeling rejected, as you said before, feeling small, feeling Unsafe in a sense that you feel it hurts your self-esteem. You feel like you are not enough. In both people, we hear that in that in that letter, right? She feels that, and he feels that. My, I work with couples all the time, so one of my <laughs> fears would be if you say, you know, I feel small, I feel rejected, 
the other person <laughs> immediately feels responsible for that and they start defending themselves and saying, you know, no flies on me. And then <laughs> the original person doesn't feel hurt and we have a we have another round of argument. Right, so right. how can you talk about your feelings of being rejected and small and whatever without actually making your partner feel, hang on, you know, I've just been handed the plate of trouble and I've got to, right. uh, I've got to make it better. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the psychoanalyst Jessica Benjamin described it as a doer and done to dynamic. Have, have you heard of that? The doer and done to. One is a splitting, basically. One is the doer, the other is the done to. And that's what you're describing. Like, I'm going to say that, you know, I feel small and you immediately become the doer to me. I'm the done to. You're making me feel small, right? Where in fact, me being small, feeling small is not about you at all. Yeah. And right. she felt small many years before she met this guy. So, you know, he's just right. the last, the end of the <laughs> end of the row, so to speak. Right. Right. And probably I think those intense dynamics happen when both people are kind of mirroring each other. You know what I mean? Like they both feel small. So they are in some ways similar. And I'm sure that you work the way I work. Uh, we unpack that feeling that the way, the history of that feeling not related mm -hmm. to the person. You take the person aside, they become a witness in mm -hmm. couple therapy of your own experiences and how they play themselves out with the partner. But the partner becomes like, you know, one of my professional books is called Dramatic Dialogue, right? It becomes a dramatic dialogue between two people, but it's not actually about the other person. So I think actually just returning to practical stuff, you know, the first words out of your mouth is, this is not about you. This is about me. Let me tell you. And then I'd like to hear about your stuff that's about you. And I'm going to try and listen without thinking it's about, you know, I've got to do something about it because yes. you do not have to rescue your partner because if you rescue your partner, you are going to put them in the victim role. and. Right. And it's very easy once we've got into this triangle to actually become the perpetrator who's actually hurting as well. And the two of you go around the circle, not the circle, the triangle. Right. I cover this on a, a different podcast, but I'll put it in the, uh, the show notes. So if you're interested, you can have a listen to it. So I have to ask you as a witness on The Meaningful Life, what makes your life meaningful? The main thing that makes my life meaningful are the people I love. My family, you know, my children, my husband. The people I love are the most meaningful thing in my life. Do you love your clients? I do, actually. I do love my clients. And you know, I feel like you know, Freud many years ago wrote and asked if, if psychoanalysis is a cure through love. And there was a lot of controversy around that. But I do feel that if I have clients that I don't love, I ask myself why. And usually there is a reason for that that is about the people that feel unlovable. It's hard to love them. And that's part of the therapy to understand why, why is that person not lovable? Yeah, I mean, that um, I offer love to my clients, but they don't all want it because, and you know, that's perfectly okay. You don't have to have, you know, we can have a, a less, a more transactional kind of a relationship. That's, that's fine. But it's always interesting, mm -hmm. the ones that hold you at a distance. Yeah, you know, I feel like love is there and you can have it or not. Right. Mm. But I think at least in the process of psychoanalysis, it's there for you. Again, as you know, you know the people that come and say, I pay you to love me. And the truth is that, no, they don't pay me to love them. They pay me for my time usually. And I sometimes I love them and sometimes I don't. But I always ask myself when I don't, why and what is in the way of loving them? And I think that's what you're saying, that those who, yeah. that some people, so, sometimes it's hard to accept love, right? Mm. Or to feel lovable, to feel that you deserve the love. Yeah. I mean, love is a scary thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. And I think especially, maybe not especially in a different way. Love is a scary thing generally, right? Always. But when it comes from your therapist, it's hard to believe it. 
it's hard to trust it. You think to yourself, what kind of, that's a strange relationship, right? Yeah. Uh, therapist yeah, and, and patient. And, you know, we're, I'm using love in an entirely non-sexual, non-relationship kind of way, just in a sort of generic, the world is full of love sort of kind of uh, Of statement. course. Of course, of course. When we talk about love in therapy, we really don't do not talk about any right anything that is about boundary violation. It's, it's a very uh, asymmetrical relationship. When as therapists we have a responsibility and a role, but it's also mutual. So feelings can be mutual, and love is one of the feelings that we have as people. Well, unfortunately, this is where the conversation ends for most people. But if you're a supporter of The Meaningful Life, you will hear um, a discussion that I'm going to have with Gallet about how to repair a relationship with an estranged family member. Because one in four adults at the moment are estranged from their parents, which is an extraordinary figure. We're going to talk about that. And she's also going to tell me three things she knows deep down to be true. So if you want to hear the bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.